extraordinary, game-changing, the best-case scenario. These are just some of the terms used to describe the outcome of the Paris climate talks during a recent discussion at the Wilson Center. With time to reflect on the agreement, a panel of experts discuss what was achieved and what remains to be done. From the role of the private sector to ways in which this agreement differs from previous attempts, the panel analyzed aspects of the deal that may mark a turning point in climate change history. That's the focus of this edition of Rewind. We are gathered here as always, to look at environmental issues that are at large scale and environmental solutions which are of similar scale. It could not be more appropriate than to have this afternoon's program on the biggest environmental agreement of all time. So this is um, a really good auspicious moment for us to be looking at the agreement and to have a sense of what has come out of it, what is the perspective from the US government, a little bit the negotiating team, what it means to the private sector, and what's a sense of the long-term policy implications. So these are the areas that we hope to cover in, in our short comments. Um, when I was in Paris, I, I met with my old friend Bjorn Lomborg, mm. who some of you may know, who likes to write articles saying Paris will achieve nothing. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the way he concludes that is he looks at all the models and he picks sort of the most extreme one. And then he assumes that, OK, the Paris Accord goes to 2025 and 2030. And after that, we'll just go back to our old ways. So when China says it will peak, actually, it's not going to peak at all. It will just stop for a moment and then it will go back. Therefore, he concludes the deal isn't very good. Missing the entire point. But the assumption is, you know, if, you, if it's going to you know, limit world temperature rise to 2.7 degrees, you've heard that number, uh, that does assume that after 2025, 2030, we keep making the same degree of progress. So even the same degree of progress won't get us to the two degrees. So the, the progress has to be ramped up. You know, those of us who track issues around loss and damage, we're looking from a developing country perspective at, at questions around compensation. And I wonder if you could give a little bit of your perspective on those issues coming out of the agreement, loss and damage and compensation for uh, the most vulnerable countries. We recognize and we have always recognized the long-term challenges uh, posed by climate change and that adaptation, uh, adaptation is, is, the, is the most important thing, but that loss and damage is, is, is not a conversation to be avoided. It's, it's something that needs to be talked about and worked on. And in fact, you know, the international community created a whole mechanism for, uh, for addressing loss and damage. What folks wanted more than anything was that, that this topic be given a clear lane forward uh, at, to, to work on. I don't think that liability and compensation or forcing that conversation was, was, uh, was high on the agenda for, for, for many countries. And that's why the agreement contains a provision that makes clear that loss and damage is a topic we'll continue to work on, but that liability and compensation is not part of it. Um, I, I wonder if you have heard any criticisms of the agreement um, or where you suspect folks may be critical of what um, has come out of Paris and are there areas where you agree and are there areas where you say, you know what, I, I really disagree, this really is different. Is that a fair question? I think that is the biggest thing okay. is it sort of it's, it's been difficult for people to grasp. Well, I don't understand. Is it the only test? Right, of success of whether or not you hit the marker that you laid out there for yourself, yes and no, right? It, it is a, an appropriate measure of success. It is now in Article, t Article 2 as the first objective of this agreement, but the totality of the process that we're setting up, the platform that we're setting up, should be, uh, is in fact, uh, uh, um, what will be the true test of whether it does that. I, I believe that this agreement will endure, and I think it will endure to future administrations. Uh, it will endure because it, it, it's precisely a deal that has learned the lessons and the bipartisan feedback of previous rounds, right? And if you look at the criticisms of Kyoto and some of the criticisms of Copenhagen, um, this is an agreement that puts all major economies on a level playing field. It has very strong transparency provisions. It features targets set by countries, not negotiated and imposed top down. It has all the features of an international agreement um, that, that, that for which there has been 
uh, a fair degree of bipartisan support. And what underpins it politically is an extremely strong show of commitment from China. We've been saying 2015 is the big year. We've got the Sustainable Development Goals, we've got COP21. Partway through COP21, we were like, actually, 2016 is the big year. M implementing all of this, waking up in January and seeing how you implement it, it's not going to be easy. There's a huge amount of opportunities. There's a lot of commitment and momentum, but we need to capitalize on that and get it going in the right direction. I do think what we've seen in terms of business and investors, I highlighted those who are really the leaders and moving ahead. There's many others who aren't yet there, aren't yet convinced, don't know what to do or whether they should. But the leaders are moving ahead, and I think when you start to look at some of the market reactions following COP21, coal market, coal, coal stocks plummeted the prices. It was a clear market signal. We're moving away. That's not something we can continue with. I think you are starting to see some of that shifting. This is a absolutely historic, game-changing. It's going to set the course, really, for this century uh, of the world economy, I mean, quite frankly. Almost every country <laughs> will benefit out of this transition. Not all, there, there will be some that are totally dependent on fossil fuel, but, but most countries, countries like the United States, China, India, the big countries, Europe, will benefit from this. That doesn't mean that everybody will benefit, um, and it doesn't mean that every company will benefit or every industry will benefit. And I think we need to be very, very sort of open and honest about that. For more information, visit wilsoncenter.org. Click the Research tab and search under the Brazil Institute, the Environmental Change and Security Program, and the Canada Institute.